or let us know in the chat, folks. Um, it is live signing session with Brandon Sanderson, answering your questions and signing lots of random things. So we have people watching on All Facebook. Right. Um, let me pull up the chat real quick. I know you guys are used to special guest stars being members of my family, but neither of my parents are here right now. So instead, you get Magellan, um, who is enjoying his pen the way that he likes to enjoy having a pen, which is by destroying it and dunking it in water. Um, Magellan, for those of you who are parrot people, he is definitely a dunker. Anything you give him, he walks over to the water and dunks it in first. Um, so... Looks we're live like we're everywhere. Good. Yep. All right. So we have to start each time by letting you guys know what this is because people are curious. I am signing copies of The Way of Kings. This is for um, the leather bound uh, for the Kickstarter that we are going to be doing in June. Um, and I am signing the first, um, what, 16 pages of this, which then get bound into the book. Um, we do this because that way we don't have to unwrap the, the great packaging that the publisher, uh, the printer does when sending them to us. Um, and instead we can, uh, just ship them right to you already signed. We were getting a lot of dings and scratches because we had to unwrap all of them, put them out for me to sign, sign all of them, wrap them all back, back up in new packaging and send them off. So just a more efficient way of handling this. And I have to do this for several hours every week or so and uh we decided that i would answer questions during this time um from you lovely folks who have sent them in to us so we have adam behind the camera and behind the other microphone uh fielding questions for me and i'm just gonna talk at you guys for the next two hours or so um while theoretically magellan chews on the rubber duck that i have hung up for him and uh we'll go with that <laughs> Uh, the first question is one, one wondering what kind of surge binding power uh, you would pick. What would I pick? pick? Yeah. Uh, I always err on the side of flying, so gravitation. I would love to be able to fly. If you can't tell that from the types of powers that I pick for main characters in my mainline Cosmere books, then yeah. Um, just one of those things. Uh, it's not the smartest one, right? Uh, there are way more practical powers to have, but what I would pick. Um, do you think you'd be able to impersonate any of your characters if you were dropped into their life? Whew. Uh, yeah, I think I could probably do a pretty good job of that. Uh, with the caveat that I don't think my impersonation skills are necessarily that good. Um, but I would know the characters well enough to impersonate them. My skill in impersonation would be the deciding factor. I am not... I don't have any training in theater or anything like that so uh the next one is a uh, couple of questions i'll break them up and just do them one mm -hmm. at a time they want to know if yasna is on the autism spectrum um i do not have yasna on the spectrum right now um so no um yasna do does have some interesting brain psychology but i would not diagnose her as being on the spectrum and the uh, Second question was, how do you stop yourself from making a story too complex or unwieldy? I have problems with this in my own story, so I want to know how you handle it. And uh, yeah, this is a great and excellent question. Uh, this happens to a lot of us, particularly when we're starting out. My first book that I ever tried to write, White Sand, which is not the version you can read, though if you haven't gotten the version you can read, you get it by joining our mailing list. Um, I rewrote it many years later to be better, and then we rewrote it again to be even better when we made the graphic novel. But the first time I tried to write it, it just spiraled out of control. Uh, too much complexity for my skill to handle as a writer. And in that case, in that particular instance, what I needed to do was just be all right with that. Meaning trying something difficult, lifting weights beyond what I was capable of lifting at that point was really good for me. It taught me how to do it better. And so some cases, this is just a matter of continuing on going, understand this is a problem that uh, you need to work on, but you learn by doing. Now, that's not the only answer, however. 
because I also failed in complexity the first time I tried to write The Way of Kings, and it was my 13th novel. And I was pretty good at writing books by then. I had written Elantris, for instance. I had rewritten White Sand and done it well. Uh, and so I knew what I was doing. And on that case, I just tried to do too many plot lines at the same time in the story. And so what ended up happening is there was so much going on that the reader couldn't track it. And you weren't getting satisfying conclusions to any of the arcs. You were just getting parts of the arcs. You'll be able to read that book uh, this summer. Uh, we've decided we're going to release The Way of Kings that I wrote in 20, 2002. Uh, the, you could call it the first draft, but I started over from scratch when I rewrote it, the version that I'm signing now. So it's almost like a parallel universe version of The Way of Kings. Uh, we're going to release that uh, for free uh, in conjunction with the Kickstarter. We were going to have it be one of the tiers and rewards you could get, but with the pandemic and with a lot of people um, having lost their jobs and a lot of the uncertainty going on, we just decided the right thing that we wanted to do was to move it out of the tiers in the Kickstarter and just release it for everyone. Uh, so right now we're putting that through a quick uh, proofread um, and things like that. And we will be releasing that. Uh, Kickstarter's like first week of July, I believe. Um, and so once that launches, we will release that to everyone. You don't have to be part of the Kickstarter to get it. Uh, and you'll be able to see what I mean by this. The book was ambitious um, and ambition is good, but in that case, what I needed to learn was not how to be better at managing plot lines, though I did get better at that afterward. Um, what I needed to learn was a great story told really well about a smaller number of characters is generally going to be a better book than part of a story of a lot of characters. And complexity is not always a virtue. Um, in a book. And so if you're having this problem consistently, one of the things I would suggest is lower the number of viewpoint characters um, or lower the number of side plots and things like this and try to narrow your focus on what is the story I'm telling in this book. Another thing that happens to us as writers a lot of times is when we're new writers in particular, but this happens to experienced writers too. We try things and it goes this way is we put too much into one book. Now this is honestly kind of a good thing in some ways because uh, I feel that more people fail at writing their stories when they just don't have enough to it. Uh, generally it's a good idea to put as much many cool things in a book as you can get, but you can go too far. And what happens is you have a book that's fighting with itself in that you have a book that doesn't have a theme, it doesn't have a soul, it's not trying to do one thing. Um, and in those cases, sometimes it's better to split that into two separate stories uh, that can have their own theme and soul. So there's a few pieces of advice. I have been there. I can't tell you from this seat whether it's a you need practice war, whether it's a focus on more characters, or if you're trying to do too many plots and it should really be two separate books, but each of those are possibilities. And indeed, it could be something else that I'm not thinking of but maybe that'll help. Um, is there a particular subgenre of fantasy or sci-fi that you would like to tackle in the future? Ooh, subgenre of sci-fi fantasy? Well, I do know what I am going to be tackling in the future, and it's this, um, this sort of, uh, I don't know if there's a good name for it. A lot of people call it mage punk. Um, I don't know that I like that as much. It's this fusion of uh, fantasy elements and science fiction elements. As I move the Cosmore more toward science fiction, it's moving more toward space opera science fiction, which I love things like, I love the fifth element. Why, what's part of one of the things I love about the fifth element um, is this idea of this space religion, right? Um, and that kind of, kind of throwback fantasy uh, religion mashed up with Far future science fiction uh, is so much fun to me. Uh, this is what we love, a lot of us, about Star Wars, right? It's the it's the everything but right now, right? All the past stuff that's cool, all the future stuff that's cool. Now, do this poorly, and it can feel like it's a story that's just throwing everything and the kitchen sink at you. What I'm hoping I'll be able to do is have realistic extrapolations where things that 
aren't present in our, you know, in our world are natural to be present in the future of the Cosmere. Um, but I, I do like that idea. I do like when magic becomes the foundation for science fiction. Um, other than that, subgenres of fantasy that I would like to tackle. What haven't I tackled that I, that I would like to try sometime? Um, I don't know. I haven't really done a true Weird West. Uh, Wax and Wayne kind of touches on that, but I haven't done what I would consider a, a, a real authentic uh, Weird West story. That uh, I could totally see as being something that I do in the future. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe if anyone thinks of cool ones, they can put them in the chat and uh, we can throw those out and say, Brandon, what do you think about this? But... Uh, in your first stream, Emily noted that she knew the big ending in Stormlight 10. Yes, she do you, does. Do you disclose the planned ending of a series, uh, for example, Stormlight or Mistborn, to your mm -hmm. editor or your team or writing group when they're re reviewing the early books in the series? How important do you think it is for them to know the conclusion of the series when reviewing a book? Uh, I don't think it's important at all for most, review most people reviewing a book. Uh, a book should stand very well on its own without the future information. Uh, though laying groundwork for future things is something I particularly enjoy. I like reading it and I like having it happen in my books. And so it's a little more important for the type of story I'm writing. That said, I don't tell the writing group, for instance, what's going to happen. Um, I There's like this kind of continuum on how prescriptive I want a, of a type of feedback I want from people. Let me see if I can explain this. Um, on the far um, uh, this side, it's my left, um, is very prescriptive. These are people who, who I want to diagnose problems in the book and offer solutions. They're people who um, I know can look at fiction in a way that looks past the current blemishes and looks toward what it's trying to be and therefore can offer feedback on what it's trying to be. Um, this is a skill that editors are trained in or that le they learn. Like this is what a, you look for in a really great editor. is somebody who can look, um, I often use this example, so apo I apologize if you've heard it before, but um, I remember on the Monsters Inc. DVD behind the scenes stuff, uh, watching and they had almost finished um, renders of like the characters going through a scene, but they hadn't put on the finishing touches. Those finishing touches make it look so much better that for me watching these models, it just looked terrible. I'm like, that's just awful. And then they talked about this and they said, you know, most viewers who see this would not be able to look past the fact that Sully doesn't have his hair yet because it is so distracting. But another animator can look past that and look at the gait of the character walking. And we can show this to another animator and they'll be like, oh, the gate's off right here. The anatomy's off right over here. I'm looking for that in books. I'm looking for people who look past the fact that the foreshadowing does not exist for this event that I'm having happen later on because I just haven't gotten the foreshadowing in yet. Or this character that I've mentioned, oh, I need to write them in to do this, just isn't in the book yet. Um, that can look past all of those things and say, here is what we're trying to do. Here's the shape of the story. And here are some problems I see with the shape of this story. Uh, so that's my editor. Uh, that's uh, my, my team, Peter and Karen um, and Isaac. Uh, these are people who can look past and can look at an outline and can see the details that will eventually be there. They're the people I show the early drafts to. In between them, you know, next along the line is the writing group. Writing group is getting fairly early drafts. Um, they, however, I, are my first chance to get a real reaction, a reaction of someone who's been unspoiled because group one, they get the outlines of everything. They know when I write the outline, I say, Here, what, here's what's happening in the book. Look over this outline. Tell me where the problems might be. And these are people who know the ending of Stormlight 10, right? Because they know uh, they can offer feedback on the shape of a large scale outline like that. Writing group, I don't tell that. Writing group, I do still look for some prescription. Some, Brandon, I think you're trying to do this. If you are, here's some help with it. Howard Taylor was in the writing group for a little while. He's, uh, he's had to, 
drop out for now, but he would often say, hey, if you want to punch this joke up, here's a way to do it. Howard writes comedy. And I always looked forward to Howard punching up one of my jokes because they were always better. And in writing group, I'm looking for people who can do that. Uh, I'm looking for someone like Scar, who's my friend who's in the military, who says, ah, this doesn't feel like any sergeant I've ever had. Uh, here's what you would say if you really want to get it across. Those are the people I really look to for that sort of thing. Next along the line would be what we call the beta readers. Beta readers are saying a complete finished novel and reading through it and just offering audience feedback. Uh, for them, I'm not looking for solutions at all. Some of the specialist beta readers, definitely I will. Like uh, we have uh, some people with, um, we have someone who has uh, disassociative identity disorder reading the current book to give me some tips on something that I'm doing in that. Uh, that, that sort of person I do look for prescriptive feedback on, but for the most part, the beta readers, I'm just looking for their reaction. How do you feel about this? Um, and things like that. And then from there, it goes to audience. And from the audience, I'm just hoping that you will just be able to enjoy it. Um, we had a few questions about editing. One in particular said, how do you make revising fun or at least tolerable? And the other one said, do you also gamify your editing process like you do your writing process? I do gamify my editing. For those who don't know, um, getting myself to do the things that I want to have done uh, usually involves some sort of gamification for me. Um, or, you know, setting a goal, measuring my progress toward that goal, and watching the little progress bar tick up. Uh, I do the same thing with editing. Uh, editing, for those who don't know, is... Oh, good job. You got it off. Um... That. I guess you guys were watching. You saw how he did that. I guess he unwound the shoelace. Now what are you going to do? You've dropped your duck and your bottle and your pen. Do you want your pen back? There you go. Um, uh, for those who don't know, the editing process is my least favorite part. This is for a multitude of reasons. Um, the most fun for me is creating something new. Exploring out into the unknown and... Um, so doing the outlining in that case. And then also I really have a lot of fun proving a concept, right? The outline is here. I've had an idea. Can I make it work on the page? And there's a thrill to making it work on the page that is really exciting to me. Uh, when a chapter comes together, particularly in something brand new, uh, it's a lot of fun to me. So that um, I don't need as much for, but writing sequels, Little less fun, right? Really satisfying. Sequels let you dig in meatily into a character, really explore them, their connection and relationship to the world, get some real depth to the storytelling and the world building. Um, it's something I want to have done. A little less fun for me. And so, particularly sequels, it's important for me to count my word counts and set goals and watch myself count upward. Revision is the, the worst um, because not only am I going through something I've already done? I am now having to confront all the flaws in this thing that when I wrote the first draft, I was really pleased with and satisfied with. And I thought, wow, this chapter is really great. And then I have to see this chapter, some of it's really great, but there are broken things that are ruining people's enjoyment or will ruin it if I publish it this way. And that can be a very difficult process. Going through a revision and having gotten, for instance, the, the most difficult one is often um, either the, the alpha read draft if a book is broken and I don't know it, um, or if that's not the case, the beta read draft where I see all the things that aren't working even in a book that's mostly working. And that's a matter of each day, you know, reading 50, 100, 200 comments about the flaws of your piece of fiction. It's like reading... 200 bad reviews. Now, these are by people who love the series and want it to be the best it can be, but it still can be difficult on you as a, as a creator emotionally. And so for revision, you've got these two things. No more sense of exploring something new. Instead, you have to go through the same thing again and make it better, and you feel like you're getting punched all the way uh, through it uh, in the face by how bad the piece of fiction is. So what do I do? Well, um, number one is gamification. I set a word count goal, and it's really important that that goal be 
something I can meet each day, the number of words that I'm going to revise. I make sure that each revision is only focusing on a couple of things. I can't fix everything every draft. Uh, if I'm doing draft four, which I'm in right now, which is beta read comments, I'm not worrying if the prose is pretty. I'm just worrying about, can I address these problems? Are they problems I need to address? Am I okay with a certain subset of the readership feeling this um, about the book? And can I improve on what I have done before? Focus only on that. So narrowing the scope and making myself have a limit that if I hit that, I'm done for the day. Um, then I can do whatever I want. And a lot of times when I'm on active writing uh, a first draft, I can actually spend less time each day because I'm kind of draining myself of, of creativity. I don't know if that works, but we talk about draining the well and letting the well reset itself and things like that. That really does happen to me. After about four hours of writing new fiction, I'm tired mentally, not emotionally. I'm usually really excited emotionally because things have come together, but mentally I'm really tired. Um, the ideas are no longer flowing and it's time to just put it down. Revision, I could go forever, right? Uh, because it doesn't drain me mentally as much as it does emotionally. And the work is not as hard in on my brain um, as creating something new. It's just hard in a different way. So I have to make sure that I tell myself I can be done because I could just keep going. I could push through and I could do 25, 30,000 words a day. Uh, it wouldn't be good. I would get so sick of the process so quickly. So instead, usually it's, I, I, I look for it to be 12 to 15,000 words if I can. Um, each day and when I've done that I actually go and I search up that chunk and I put a star on the document map on the, the chapter title of the one that I have to reach and when I'm done go play civilization go you know read a book go uh, do whatever it is I want to do and I've set the goal in such a way that that's going to take me a normal day's work but um, if I go a little faster I can be done a little sooner and things like that, that's very important uh, for me. And revision, it's a little more important to have something fun that I'm looking forward to at the end of it. Um, that helps a lot. Having a new video game, the trick is, it has to be the right kind of video game though. It has to be the sort of video game that um, I'm looking forward to playing, but I'll be done with after a mission or two. Uh, because the danger in that is that you go to work for the day and you're like, man, I could just take today off and play the video game. Uh, that's a dangerous mindset when you work from home and you set your own goals and your own pace. Um, and so, for instance, Civilization is probably a bad example because I usually don't play that when I'm doing revision. It's one of my favorite games, but Civilization is one of those games that when you start a game, it consumes you and you feel like you just have to keep going. You want to keep going, you're eager, um, and uh, it would interrupt my ability to play. Uh, Animal Crossing has been great, right? Get done, I play for an hour. I can really only handle about an hour of Animal Crossing and then I'm done. Um, that's been a really good match for me. A lot of the, um, the roguelite games like FTL work very well for me in this way because if you can play through a game in an hour or two, which I can't remember how long FTL takes, it's been a while, but Slay the Spire, I could usually, you know, do in an hour or two. Um, I'm done with that run, great. Now I, you know, I, I can go to bed, get up tomorrow, and then when I'm done with my revision that day, I do another run and Slay the Spire, so, yeah. Um, this one from the chat I thought was fun. Um, they say, can Skybreakers vow to follow a code of rules some might consider outlawish, like the pirate code? Are they obliged to adhere to changes in the law after their vow? Yes and yes. Cool. So, yeah. Uh, Skybreakers, um, what, what you're running into with, uh, with what's happening right now to not give too many spoilers, the Skybreakers are under the thumb of someone who has a much more rigid interpretation of what they should do than is um, necessary for the, uh, for the order. Um, and so you could totally be a Skybreaker who is not of this group. And uh, this group would not look kindly on something like the Pirate Code necessarily, though the Pirate Code kind of works for them because it's in, in international waters. 
So it would actually, even with the current crop of Skybreakers, you could probably argue the pirate code and they'd probably be okay with it. Um, but you could have even less, you know, codes. It's like, I'm going to follow the code of the criminal underground. I'm going to follow the mafia code. Current crop of Skybreakers, you would, that would not fly with them. But in the order in general and the way that high spren work and things like that, you'd totally be okay. Um, which is kind of dangerous. Um, yes, but you also would be, you would have to follow the code as the code changes. Um, so that could get you into, into trouble also. Uh, Skybreakers have a, yeah, they have, they, they have, they've got an interesting way of uh, going about all this. Hopefully all the orders do. Uh, that's one of my goals with them, but yeah. Um, this next person wants to know how the Mistborn screenplay is going um, and want to know what it's like adapting your own work from over a decade ago. Yeah, um, so first, um, I've been running the screenplay through my writing group um, and they've got some, some great feedback. Uh, the biggest challenge right now with the screenplay is um, actually with Vin's character. Um, this is because a lot of what you get to know about Vin in the course of Mistborn is really internally motivated. She's actually pretty quiet, um, rather shy for, you know, someone who does what she does. Um, and so, and keeps a lot of her emotions and thoughts close to her heart. That is hard to show in a screenplay. Um, and uh, really difficult to pull off in an action adventure screenplay where you need people to be moving and things like this. And uh, the danger is um, having Vin come across as just an artful dodger, right? As this confident street thief, which was the first version of Vin that I wrote trying to pull off in the books and then failed. Do you need another toy? What are you doing? Um, yes, hello. Do you want to do a trick for them? Okay, okay, no, put it down. You have to get cued for it. Okay, <laughs> use the force. Good bird. He was very excited to show you guys his trick. Um, why don't I tie your duck back up and you can, you can play with the duck? Um, no, you can't get down. You're gonna eat the buttons on my, sh on my coat. <laughs> I'll get you down in a little bit. Here, play with the duck. Yeah, play with the duck. Um, so the first version of Vin I tried that I failed at this is just one chapter before I wrote the book. She was a very, you know, kind of your more generic street thief sort of thing. You're Aladdin, you're artful dodger, right? Um, and Vin didn't work that way. It partially was too generic. Not that those characters are generic, they just, they've been genericized, they've been done so much. Um, and so I tried this other version, this non-self-confident version of Vin that had this really interesting uh, dynamic going on inside of her about wanting to trust but not being sure if she could. And that really made the book work. Getting that across in the screenplay, super hard. Um, so that's been the challenge. Fitting it into screenplay format has actually not been hard. I haven't written the screenplay, it's all in the treatment stage. Hello? Um, but, um, do you lose your duck? It's not on that side, it's on the other side. Yeah. Um, how is it adapting something that I wrote over 10 years ago now? It's actually been in some ways liberating because I have enough distance from it. I can see structurally the things that I can change, uh, I think easier than if I'd been closer to it. But also um, a little bit hard because it is something so long ago, I have to keep going back to the book and reading sections of the book and reminding myself of things that I wrote in the book. So. Um, like the scene where Vin and Ellen meet is one of my favorite scenes in the book, but I still had to go back and reread that scene to get it into the treatment in, um, because I had forgotten the actual dialogue cues and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, it's a challenge, but it's also liberating. Uh, you said earlier that Rhythm of War includes a key sequence that you've that you have envisioned for years. Yep. How does it feel to have captured the sequence and are you personally happy with the result? Uh, feels great to finally write that sequence and now that the beta reads are in, I can say the sequence works. Um, and so really, really pleased, uh, really happy that it came together. There were other things that needed to change, uh, but that one worked. Uh, there almost been no edits or revisions to that whole sequence uh, in the through all the drafts. Uh, I've been planning it for so long. It's one of those things that I wrote and it was 
as I imagined it, and it came together. Um, and you will be able to read it in part five of uh, Rhythm of War um, coming up. Um, so, yeah, November. Uh, this next question comes from... Oh, don't have a name. Um, I am trying to build up a team of heroes in my story, but for thematic reasons, they aren't the quote-unquote underdogs. Mm. So the underdog sports story plot yep. archetype is difficult to apply. Yep. What plot and character beats would you consider important to achieving this goal? Great. There's so many different places you can go with this one, um, and it really depends on where you're going. Uh, a lot of high stories are very good at this, too. You don't have to use the heist aspect. You can use the relationship aspect. And if you go look at what makes some of them interesting, um, so a lot of times... What will make a team dynamic really cool if they're all already specialists is someone new gets added and has to integrate into the team, right? That happens a ton. Uh, this is, this is you know, Ocean's Eleven. They're recruiting in, like, the what is it, the son of one of the other players? Anyway, uh, Matt Damon's character, I believe it is. Brand new in the team, and he has to figure out how he fits among this group. You can also go with the... Uh, you know, the Shaolin, no, that Shaolin soccer doesn't do this. Um, it's the go get a whole bunch of people who used to be a team and bring them back together, whatever that is. Um, um, uh, you've, you've seen versions of this. It happens in Westerns a lot. We're going to go get the whole posse together uh, to go hunt down this person. And they've all kind of moved on in their lives. And so going back to their old roles is hard for them. Um, that sort of team dynamic can work really well and be very cool. Um, Getting the, the kind of the most archetypal right now is probably the Avenger style where everyone is so good at what they do. They're a little arrogant and assuming that they don't need everyone else. And in that kind of story, uh, what you're looking for, the beats, the number one, show how competent they are in their own sphere. But then showing the audience, even if they don't recognize it, where the holes in each of their abilities are. And then showing them come together around something that they all want to do. It, it's a challenge, and Joss did it really well in The Avengers, uh, just brilliantly. The big challenge is making sure that, how shall I say this? In a, give, in a normal story, that transition from I'm not sure about this to I'm all in, and this, this is deeply personal, and I'm going to make it happen, is a big character moment for your main character. And a lot of stories, a lot of stories, it's this kind of move from inactive to proactive, or even for a normally proactive character, it's the move from this was just a job and now it's more than a job, uh, which happens with a lot of established powerful characters instead of underdogs is that transition. Um, pulling that off with a whole group together is really hard, but really satisfying when it happens. And the Avengers does that uh, quite well. So... Um, but that's not the only dynamic you can have going on here, right? Like, uh, a lot of great team dynamics have the leader has died and the new leader is trying to fill this person's shoes and can't. And so the team has to change to something else along the way. And you are watching them all realize this and trying to figure out how the dynamic works now that they've lost their leader. Hello. Oh, there you go. You guys got to see a pooping macaw on, uh, on my live stream. Um, yeah. You are no longer interested in toys. You are now interested in, uh, in coming and bothering me, huh? Yes. Hello. I see you. Yeah. I'm going to do a fan mail, and then I'll give you some scriptures. Um, all oh, right. They got moved. Oh, they uh, got moved. No, just right here. Okay. Yeah. So let's do, uh, let's do a fan mail. Uh, if you guys want to send me fan mail, um, then you can go ahead and uh, Adam's going to pop up. This one is from Chase, um, and Chase says, I want to thank you for not only being the best, most consistent, most entertaining writers out there, but for inspiring me. Thank you very much, Chase. I appreciate that. Um, I'm proud to say I'm coming up on 85,000 words. Really? That is incredible. Uh, finishing your first book uh, is like one of the most satisfying things that can happen in your life. Uh, I enjoy finishing every book, but nothing is compared to finishing the first one. Uh, proving to myself that I could do it, like really having it happen. Uh, it's one of those wonderful and uh, beautiful moments. And so I'm glad I inspired you to do this. Um, I appreciate you. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> um, so you say, don't doubt you remember, but I remember chasing you down in Provo Town Center Mall in the opening night of Amazing Spider-Man 2. 
Um, uh, that movie was not fantastic. Uh, uh, and awkwardly telling you I was a fan. I apologize for not having swag to give me. Uh, we sometimes carry swag around that we'll give people uh, little little stickers or things like that. I appreciate the fan mail, Chase. Um, I'll read the rest of this later. Uh, they just highlighted some parts for me to look at. Um, but I'm glad, yeah, you, uh, that, that finishing that first book. Oh, it is, it is such a moment. Uh, it, is, it is wonderful and magical. Um, do, you, do we want to do our, our giveaway thing? Sure. Um, so I'm going to uh, let Jello come over and see if I can keep him from biting my, uh, my uh, buttons while Adam explains what we're doing. What? So uh, recently we just uh, surpassed 50,000 subscribers on Brandon's channel. So thank you all for uh, being a subscriber. And to honor that, we wanted to do a little giveaway. Um, maybe little is the wrong term, right. but uh, we're going <laughs> to... We have some people making gestures in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to give away uh, an entire collection of Brandon's leather-bound books. So that's going to be Elantris, all three Mistborn books, and Warbreaker. Which we're currently sold out of. Which oh, we are... We don't oh, have we're out of Warbreaker. We're Never mind. I'm sorry. Just those four. We're out of Elantris. Oh, oh, we're out of Elantris. Okay. So the first three Warbreaker... First three, Mistborn and Warbreaker. And Warbreaker. I can't talk. Um, so sorry, no Elantris. Um, and then two runner-up prizes will be uh, the hardcover first three books of uh, Stormlight Archive. Yep. And Edge Dancer. So if you want to enter to win that, all you have to do is uh, be a subscriber to uh, Brandon's newsletter, which you can do on his website, just brandonsanderson.com. And then if you email, just... Uh, Leatherbound, maybe make that the subject. Yep. Um, contest at brandonsanderson.com. That will automatically enter you to win. I'll close this on June 5th. And uh, yeah, just one entry per person. Uh, if you enter more than once, I will. Yeah, we'll run a <laughs> remove thing. You. Yeah. We'll remove you. Yeah. It's just by um, e email address. Yeah. And, and then uh, I'll select a winner on June 6th yeah. and uh, we'll reach out. Mm -hmm. But that's it. So there you are. There you are. Uh, so Leatherbounds. Jell is getting his scritches. Uh, I don't know if anyone else's uh, macaws do this, but he really likes to suck on his thumb. Really chew on his talon. He doesn't suck, he chews uh, as he gets scritches. So that's what you saw him doing earlier. Right now, he's trying to get to Adam. Uh, oh. I don't know why he's trying to get to Adam. Maybe he wants to bite the cords, but... There um, are many of them. There are so. many cords. Come on, come on. Um, nope, you got to come off. Yeah, I know. I know, you don't want to come off. Um, but... Um, you are a good bird, being a very good bird. You didn't eat any of my buttons, but you can't be on my shoulder while I sign. That's just not going to work. I know. I know you want to be on my shoulder. He, you know, birds, they like to be in the highest place possible. And um, I'll tell you, one of the, the funnest things is my wife likes to go on her little, little scooter uh, with my boys on their scooters, and Magellan will hold on to her hoodie while she scooters around um, outside. We have his leash on him, so he can't, uh, can't get lost. And he will just cling there and put his wings out and zip around. Uh, we're trying to start flight training him, but uh, he's very timid about flight training because the, uh, the breeders cl did clip him. Um, and so he has just grown out of his clipping, but he, uh, he's, he's a little timid about flying right now. So we're gonna get there, see. He, he's, he thinks he's going to fly to Adam, but he's not going to. Come um, on. One thing I forgot to mention. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention about the giveaway. It is worldwide so long as we can find a way to ship it to yep. you. So, uh, You're that's, okay. that's the big determinant. Uh, that's not an issue for most places in the You're world. Okay. So feel free to enter. So, see there now you want your scratches, But I have to put you back because I have to sign things. Yeah. You can't be scratched all night, even though you would sit here. And be scratched all night if you could be. Do you want a nut? Can you use the force? Use the force. Yeah, good bird. All right. I was going to see if he would lay upside down for you guys because he, uh, he's, we've been training him on that uh, so that I can, uh, so I can file his nails, uh, get him to lay on his back. But he doesn't like doing it when there are other people around. He's nervous about the other people. Um, but he is getting much better at it, aren't you, Jello? Uh, laying upside down on his back and letting me uh, hold his talons so that I can file them. 
Uh, I'm going to show the email address one more time for those who are just coming yep. into the chat. Mm -hmm. If you are a subscriber to Brandon's news uh, newsletter, which you can do at brandonsanderson.com, and you email Leatherbound or whatever, uh, it doesn't really matter, um, to contest at brandonsanderson.com, that will enter you, and I'll pick a winner on June 6th. Yeah. So there's the address for you one more time. There are a lot of you, so I'm sorry <laughs> we're only giving away three this time, but... Uh, we will give, do more giveaways yeah, in we, the future. Yeah, we'll do these periodically. Yep. So. Um, another question from the chat mm -hmm. that I found interesting. Yep. Um, they want to know if utilitarianism was the inspiration or part of the inspiration for Taravangian. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Makes sense. Um, so, yep. Um, the next question, uh, this person wants to know, what do you do when you have to write someone who is far wiser or smarter than yourself? I have to do this all the time. Um, uh, there, I would say every character I write is wiser or smarter than me in some way. Um, I'm one of these people who kind of believes in a wide variety of types of intelligence and wisdom. Uh, and um, yeah, so the big advantage that you have as a writer is that you can set up the situation perfectly to reflect what you want to do. Um, I uh, it was roommates in college um, with a man named Ken Jennings. Uh, some of you may know Ken uh, from his Jeopardy uh, appearances. And um, Ken uh, is very good friends, um, and uh, I met through him a man named Earl who is, uh, he used Camera Panda, for those who watch those, he's the, the, the person who recorded those. Um, and Earl is equally smart to Ken, as is uh, Ken's brother, um, Nathan. And I found it really fascinating to be around these three. Um, I would have trouble, like, these are definitely the three most intelligent people I've ever known in the kind of raw intelligence way that we kind of, we look at, which we would call quick recollection, quick ability to adapt to a situation, and a vast, vast store of knowledge to draw upon. Uh, if we equate it to computer terms, they've got large hard drives full of information and a really, really fast uh, uh, search algorithm or whatever it is that can draw that stuff out. And they have the intellectual capacity to make decisions on the fly and to, um, to share them. And they mostly use this to try to trump one another with Simpsons quotes. Um, and you would watch the three of them get together and it's almost like you watch their engines start to rev and they, their minds start to overclock as they start to go faster and faster and more and more references and more and more humor that's three steps um, beyond what I'm even paying attention to. Uh, and putting the three of those in the same room together, those, those three uh, genius level intellects, really taught me a lot about what we would consider traditional intelligence, which is this quick recollection. Well, you can fake most of that in your writing. The way you can fake it is what they're able to do is they're able to respond to the situation very quickly. Well, you can set up the situation perfectly to get the punchline that you want delivered um, in the case of a, of, a, of a smart character. You can set up, um, th this is how classic two-person comedy acts work, right? One sets it up and the other delivers um, the, the joke. Um, you also have as much time as you need to pull out the perfect reference, joke, or piece of wisdom. Um, and you're able to fake most of this by just applying a lot of time and to be setting up the situation. Um, <clears throat> I carry with me a notebook. Um, um, and what, one of the things that the notebook does, um, is the notebook has places in a book where I needed someone to say something wise, intelligent, or otherwise relevant, um, that is phrased really well. And sometimes those are placeholders in a draft where I'm just like, <clears throat> I don't know what to say here. Something needs to be here. Um, and I write down those situations. And when I have five minutes, I pop it open and I say, all right, what would be the perfect response right here? Um, 
remember that uh, wisdom is often um, very contextual and characters can be wise or intelligent in very different ways. And part of writing for me is exploring these different types of wisdom and the different ways that different characters see the world. And that one isn't nearly so hard because when I'm really in the mindset of the character, I can see how they would see the world and I can see how this is relevant to everything else. And I'm trying very hard to express um, what they want to say, what that character would want to say in a way that's gonna, it's gonna feel right. Um, but the characters who are smarter than me, that's, uh, that's at least how I approach it. Uh, other people may have different pieces of advice there. Uh, one of them might be just be a genius, um, but that's not something I have power over for myself, so I have to fake it. Um, the next person wants to know how you come up with the names for the big baddies in your books. Um, do you consider keeping a balance between a unique name like Sauron and something more straightforward like the Dark One? Uh, yes, I do. Um, and different stories require sort of different types uh, of, of naming. This is more than just big bad guys. Um, this is naming in general. And it's how unique you want the name to be versus how iconic versus how easy to pronounce versus how difficult to pronounce and these there are no hard fast answers to this right um i still remember a review of elantris where uh the reviewer did not have nice things to say about my names which i can totally see because elantris a lot of the names are very fantasy unique I do have a bit of my, a chip on my shoulder regarding this. Uh, a lot of times in fantasy and science fiction, we like to make fun of the name with apostrophes, right? Uh, there's a famous fandom, somebody wrote it, someone will probably link it, where they suggested that apostrophes should be pronounced as boing. Yeah, so, you know, like uh, Anne McCaffrey had a character who was named Falar. So you would pronounce them Faboingar. Um, just to be silly, right? Uh, pronounce the apostrophes as boing. Um, and a lot of people will make fun of this idea of you're using lots of apostrophes and whatnot. Uh, that's fantasy cliche. And on one hand, it is a bit because a lot of us writing our books when we're brand new are like, it'll look exotic with lots of apostrophes, um, which is definitely a wrong way to be thinking, at least on one axis. But at the same time, a fantasy language really would probably be unpronounceable to us. And this comes down to your own personal decisions there. I have stopped ever making fun of the names that somebody decides to use in their book because who am I to say what a fantastical world's naming conventions would be like. I like it when people do interesting and different things. I like when people are like apostrophes and, uh, and dashes. Great, no problems here. Um, that said, balancing that with things that people in the primary language in which you're writing can understand, read, and remember is a bit of an art. And finding names that will work both in English and Alephi, for instance, is one of the things that I spend a lot of time on when I was designing the Stormlight Archive. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think that there are any simple answers here. I like both methods. I think they both achieve interesting things. And a lot of people in fantasy like to be like, everything's named something stupid like Mount Doom. Uh, who named something Mount Doom? Well, if you go back and look at real names of places, like this, which Tolkien did, you'll find that there are a whole lot of places that are named the city on the river, or by the mountains, or just really simple names are really, really common in our own, a um, lot of our cultures. Uh, that's just how people would name things. Yeah, go to the river town. That is where, and then a lot of those names have changed over time to the point that we no longer, you know, remember where they came from. Um, like my, my name, which is Alexanderson, Brandon Alexanderson is where Sanderson comes from. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. What do I do? Um, I have mostly erred on the side of making a linguistics for my worlds where 
I can give someone, particularly the main characters, names that will pronounce well in English but also fit the linguistics. And for the, um, the shards of Adenalsium, which are the basically the deities of the Cosmere, um, I have picked things like Odium, Ruin, and Preservation uh, to be words that are really easy to... I mean, they mean something. You understand exactly what they are. There's going to be 16 of them, so trying to remember uh, all 16 uh, different names. If they weren't something like that, it was going to be really hard. It makes it easier to keep witches witch. Uh, it has an ominous feel to them, and they regionalize, translate into like other languages really easily. So that's what I've done for the most part. Um, this next person wants to know if you can talk a little bit about Dark One uh, and basically yeah. anything else that's going on here, and they look Ooh. forward to the graphic novel. Fun stuff happening with Dark One. So we do have, um, we did get, um, so there is this thing where they were going to do free comic book uh, day, which... Uh, happens. Uh, it's a cool thing that comic book shops do. And um, we printed off 1,500 of these to give away at comic books shops. And then all the comic book shops closed and Free Comics Day was canceled. So we were sent by the publisher all 1,500 of these. And they said, can you find a use for these? And we said, we sure can. So we've just started slipping them in uh, any orders that people make uh, on the Brandon Sanderson store if you guys buy books or shirts. Uh, not the smallest things. Uh, the smallest things we can't fit them into. So if you buy like the uh, the book plates or stickers or something, we can't get them there. But books and t-shirts, uh, we're just sending out these previews. Um, they did just a spectacular job with this. Um, we have been extremely pleased uh, with the writers, the artists, and everybody over at Vault who put this together. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this. Uh, it looks spectacular. It came together really, really well. Um, it follows what I came up with um, quite well. Uh, it's, um, it's exciting. Uh, so the comic book is done. The graphic novel is done. Um, and because of all this, uh, we're going to be do, doing something kind of different with the release because the comic book shops, you know what's going on there. The details I'll have to share later, but basically we'll put it up for pre-order um, on my website probably. Um, and then we'll get digital copies to people very soon thereafter is the idea. Adam, you know more about this, right? Yeah, but a lot of things are still... A lot of things are still in the air. Yeah. It'll be released sometime this year, and we will be getting them to Pro you. Probably within a few months, I Yeah, imagine. probably within a few months. Uh, uh, coronavirus has really uh, put a hamper... Uh, damper? Dampener? A dampener. Uh, it's put a dampener on and has put uh, a roadblock in the way of getting out something like a new graphic novel. Um... And boy, I feel for those comic shops. I hope uh, everybody's okay. And um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to get this to you guys. Um, and I am really excited with it. And uh, we are working on the uh, audio version. We're doing it as an audio original, the the actual prose version. I don't know when that will happen. Uh, probably with that one, I'm gonna do it with Dan Wells. Is most likely what's gonna happen. Um, he and I together. And then a uh, television show. There's been no movement that I really know about. Uh, Joe Straczynski um, did email me a little while ago, talked about when he thought he was going to have the pilot uh, script ready and things like that. Um, and so there's, there's still some progress there. Actually, he, did he send us the pilot? He did send us the pilot, didn't he? Yeah, he did. So. Uh, he sent a first draft of the pilot that, um, um, that I did read, so I do know that he sent it. Uh, but basically... It's it's TV. Things are working along. Uh, it's coming along slowly. Who knows? Uh, you know. Well, if they start filming, I'll go out and uh, enjoy. Um, Joe, Ma Joe Michael Straczynski is a blast. Uh, he is quite the character, and I have loved chatting with him and going out to dinner with him and things like that. Um, and he knows his stuff. Uh, the show will be his thing, right? Um, I will be involved, but got to let the showrunner make the show that they want to do. So. Um, that's where we are. We'll see. Yeah. Um, this next question says, what fascinates you the most about creating sci-fi fantasy worlds or about world bu building in general? What are you looking for when creating a world? Yeah, what am I looking for? Something I haven't seen before, but that I would want to visit. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, this next one is, in Warbreaker, you dealt delicately with sex and sexuality, especially in the first half. 
How did you find that line of what was appropriate and what wasn't, especially given the culture of sex within the region in which you live? Right. So with Warbreaker, um, with all of my books, basically I am thinking less about uh, the culture in which I live and my, more with my own, um, my own personal lines on these sorts of things. And I've constantly said, and I still believe, that one can write mature fiction without graphic content. Um, that is what I like to try to do. And Warbreaker is in part a attempt to explore where I would want to go with these sorts of themes and ideas in a book where I was expressly not being explicit, um, but also um, going further across lines than I normally went to see you know, across lines is probably the wrong term. Going further along a, a path, because uh, I don't think really that I have lines. I have paths I go on, and at some point I'm like, mm, this path, um, this is as far as I want to go on this path. And it's not like I draw some line in the sand. It's just my own gut instinct. Um, and so with Warbreaker, ooh, did you... Oh, you've been working on that one forever. With Warbreaker, I just... Um, wrote what I was comfortable writing and maybe even pushed myself a little further and said, am I comfortable with this or not? Uh, and as writing it, I thought, no, this is dealing with the topic in a mature way that I like. Um, and it worked for me. So um, it was an experiment and a kind of a, a, a give and take, but every book that I write is that to one extent or another. Uh, this is just one of the areas that I was focusing on when I wrote Warbreaker. Uh, this next one, just from the chat, uh, they want to know what your favorite painting is. Ooh, my favorite painting? Uh, the Verge by Michael Whalen. Uh, it's the, the Michael Whalen painting that inspired uh, Elantris when I was 17 years old or whatever. Uh, that inspired the ideas that eventually became Elantris. How about that? The ideas that t 10 years after that were still bouncing around in my brain, having transformed a ton. So I would probably say that. And, um, yeah. Oh, and if you were to go outside of yeah, this outside world, who would you pick? Outside of this world? Well, outside of like... Yeah, if I were going to go like a yeah. classic painting yeah. or something like that. Um, I've always loved Monet um, and the Impressionists in general. Um, I love going to Giverny and walking around and seeing all of that and all the paintings. And um, and there's a copy of The Wave uh, at Giverny on the wall there, um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, that Monet owned. Um, though probably I would go for my absolute favorite. I would probably pick a Van Gogh and it would probably be one of the stereotypical ones. Probably be Starry Night or something like that. Um, just because there's something fantastical about that painting. Um, and you can look at it and you can feel the real world in some ways better than you could in a realistic painting. Um, but it also transports you somewhere. So probably Starry Night. Um, yeah. That's a good uh, one. Impressionists really, really work for me. All of the Impressionists I just love. Um, the ne this next one says, how did you go about creating Vin? And also, who is your uh, favorite character in fantasy? How did I go about creating Vin? Is yeah. that what it was? Yeah. How did you go about creating Vin? How did I go about creating Vin? Um, so with Vin, I uh, explored. I wrote several chapters from different viewpoints of someone I knew. <clears throat> so Kelsier was already created, um, and I knew what type of story I was writing. I was writing a heist story where um, a new character gets recruited into the team. I talked about that earlier. And it has to find their place in this established team. I knew that the main, uh, the leader, Vin is the main character, but the leader of the team would be Kelsier, who was someone who had uh, been a gentleman thief and had found more meaning in life. I knew what his arc was going to be. Um, and I needed someone who played off of Kelsier very well um, and someone who um, <clears throat> could, I was really interested in writing about. And so I tried very thing. I tried Vin as a guy also. I tried. I just tried a bunch of different uh, viewpoints for Vin, and um, it was the third one that I liked and I settled on. Um, and I just 
took it and ran with it. This is how I often kind of come up with characters is this try exploring the world through their eyes, see how it works. If it does run with it and refine it over the next few chapters to the point that eventually I really know who it is. Now, this often requires me to throw away the first few chapters I've written from a character's viewpoint and write them again after the book is done. Uh, that's really common for me uh, because of this kind of discovery writing exploration of character that I do. And that's, that's where Vin came from. I think we posted um, one of those as a deleted scene, one of the, one of the Vin chapters um, as a deleted scene. I can't remember, it's been forever. Uh, what was the second question there? Uh, favorite fantasy character. Favorite fantasy character of all time? <sighs> oh boy, Perrin. Perrin from Wheel of Time, probably. There was a few people who guessed that. Yeah, um, I mean, <clears throat> it's it's hard to beat Perrin. Um, <clears throat> I, we're rewatching the Lord of the Rings films uh, with my children who have never seen them. Uh, extended editions. Um, and... Uh, I'm remembered how wonderful Ian McKellen's Gandalf is, both as Gandalf the Grey and as Gandalf the White. And uh, one of the, and I love Gandalf. I would probably pick Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Everyone else picks Sam. I understand. Totally got you. Uh, but probably Gandalf. Um, I love the transition from Grey to White. Now, as a kid, I hated it. Um, when I read Gandalf the White, um, my first time through Lord of the Rings, something always felt wrong to me in, in, in uh, the books. And maybe this is a place where I like the films a little better. Uh, blasphemy, I know. Is Ian McKellen is at, able to add a continuity to that character um, and show the Gandalf who has in some ways stepped up to take the place of his former... Um, you know, former leader of the, the wizards who has fallen and taken his place. And just the transition from worried, concerned, still wise, but, uh, but in some ways immature Gandalf, which is weird to say about, you know, the character with the big white beard, this is not supposed to be immature, into confident um, archangel, basically is a beautiful transformation that Ian McKellen just nails in that series. Uh, when he shakes off the, the cloak, when he's, uh, when he's confronting Saruman uh, at, at, at Rohan, is just such a wonderful moment. Um, and so, so Gandalf, let's give a, give a big thumbs up to Gandalf also. Um, but yeah, um, I will always have a fondness in my, in my heart for Polgara. Uh, from the David Eddings books. Um, so there's, a, there's that, but there's a few for you. Um, this next one is long. I apologize, but I think mm -hmm. it's an interesting question. Um, they say, in a Google video you once made, you talked about how you never knew Robert Jordan. You knew his family, friends, world, and characters, but not him. You wrote the end of his life's work, uh, that juggernaut that is and was the Wheel of Time. In the Emperor's Soul, Shai had, uh, had to build up something new from journal entries from the Emperor as well as pieces from her to make what she thought was a better man. Long question short, is this analogy baseless or do you in some way see uh, the Wheel of Time as your Emperor's Soul? Sorry, you know, there's an interesting connection there that I'd never thought about before. Reconstructing the person from the lore of their life rather than themselves. Uh, where that falls apart is I still maintain, um, and I, I doubt there's much contention on this point, that uh, Robert Jordan could have done a better job of his ending than I did. Um, this is in the definition, right? And so I had to, re it's, I couldn't reconstruct, like in that case, like the whole goal of the Emperor's Soul is that she's creating a work of art that replaces the original, but in many ways is superior to the original, right? Uh, I don't think I did that. Um, but I did have that experience of trying to recreate, in some ways, Robert Jordan from uh, all the pieces, uh, all the lore, all the ephemera. Uh, so I love that you've made that connection. And I, I certainly think that there was something I was, yeah, there's something there, definitely something there. Uh, but I don't know that the metaphor sticks in the, the large scale. 
Uh, what a wonderful question. I'm glad you read that one. Um, one thing <clears throat> I've wondered about is the connection between promises and progress. Mm -hmm. When these don't connect, the pacing can feel off. But how do you recognize a potential mismatch before sending it to beta readers? Uh, beta readers are the way you recognize this in most cases for me. Um, I have not been great at noticing this until I get feedback um, a lot of times. Now, I hope that I'm, you know, this is, it's been a long process to figure out how to make this work as a writer just by writing myself. And I would think that my early books, I got better and better at this. I don't know if there's anything specific I do to look at it and ask myself promises and progress. Uh, it's when I watch for the beta reader reactions and I get a mismatch to what I thought I was going to get that I usually can identify these sorts of things. It's, it's reader responses. The reason for this being, uh, this is common to all writers I know, at least it, it happens to me and, and to my friends, um, is that one of the hardest things about writing books is pretending you don't know all the stuff in your head. When you are writing one of these plot lines, you think that you have made the appropriate promises and the appropriate payoffs because you see the whole plot in your head. You know where you're going. You know what the characters are thinking and feeling, and it all makes sense to you, but it doesn't all get on the page. And so when you get feedback from beta readers and they are confused about something or something is feeling off to them and you realize, oh, I've been working under this assumption all along that they understood this character is trying to achieve this, but because I knew the character was trying to achieve that, never really made it clear on the page, and I just wrote with that assumption. I need to make that a little more clear. And uh, that is, yeah. Um, this is why beta readers are so essential to my process. I do know writers who don't use them, and uh, they get along just fine. Uh, I find them essential for this reason, among others, but this is one of the big ones. Um, once, uh, once Rhythm is War is out and we do a spoiler-filled Rhythm, Rhythm of War stream, which we will do, uh, then I will talk about um, like what some of the big changes because of the beta readers' suggestions or really their feedback. They didn't even highlight a couple of these. Uh, they just gave feedback that made me understand it that I changed even in this book to make sure that the promises were being made. Uh, and in a lot of cases with me, it's improper promises. The progress and the payoff usually match, and the promise up front doesn't when I, when I have a mismatch. Uh, this next question is fun. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, I was wondering if the pure Lakers get pruny feet because of the water. If not, is it because they have special feet, or, has, or does it have to do with the magic fish? Uh, they have adapted over time, and so they do not have... Magic feet, they have special feet, but yes, they have adapted over time uh, to their situation. Uh, now, let's, uh, let's make the note that uh, most natural selection does not work on the time scale of the Cosmere. Um, and so there probably have to be some magical foundations for this. The fact that everyone on Roshar is invested with a bit of um, investiture more than average is going to push people over time in a way, what his toy is like. His toy is, oh, your toy is all the way down here. I see what happened. That's why you can't get your toy. I'm not going to put you on my arm yet. I know. I know what you want to do. I'm going to give you your duck. Here, get that duck. Get in. Yeah, get in, get in, get in. No, you don't want the duck. You want to get down and play on my hands. Um, so the kind of the rationale I give myself on this is because intent and these sorts of things are so important cosmologically that um, we, get, we get evolution on a faster scale in most of the Cosmere. Um, and so uh, you can see this just by adaptations that have happened since the history of Roshar itself and the arrival of uh, humans on Roshar and things like that. Cool. Um, this next question comes from Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, will the 10th book of the Stormlight Archive be the last book in the Cosmere Universe, or are there plans to continue with other stories in the Cosmere Universe indefinitely? Uh, so the last chronological book of the Cosmere sequence is the final Mistborn book. So the way that the, the structure works right now, uh, Mistborn, so Elantris, 
Mistborn Era 1, um, Stormlight Archive First 5, Mistborn Era 2, um, Elantris 2 and 3, um, Stormlight Archive 6 through 10, um, then the final Mistborn Era is how I'm going. Right? Did I miss one? I did miss one. Uh, I will do so that I missed an era. So I'm going to do the Wax and Wayne era and the era, the the third, the 1980s era kind of together. Um, and so uh, mash those together. So era one, era two, three, Stormlight one through five, Stormlight six through ten, uh, era, era four of Mistborn is how it is right now. Uh, era four of Mistborn will be the last chronological. Uh, we will have the flashbacks to Dragonsteel after Stormlight 10, but before uh, Era 4 of Mistborn. Uh, I do not intend it to go um, indefinitely. If I manage to get all of that done before I die, which I hope I will, uh, I move pretty quickly, so that then there's a decent chance I will write other Cosmere books that happen in the Cosmere, either um, probably during this time frame, at some point unconnected or only tangentially related and things like that. Uh, but I do intend that to be final book of the Cosmere sequence, uh, and I have no plans for anything chronologically after that. Okay, and did you mention Warbreaker in there? Warbreaker is a side project. I okay. do count Warbreaker. There will be a sequel to Warbreaker, but Warbreaker, Emperor's Soul, Silence Divine, all of these things that I might write, the, un the unnamed Threnody novel, uh, these are... These are not what I consider like the core essential Cosmere books that I need to write. Uh, I need to do Dragonsteel, Mistborn, Elantris, and Stormlight. And that's like, that's like your core um, uh, sequence of stories. Um, and if I can get Aether of Night in there, I sure hope that I can. If I can get the Threnody novel in there, I sure hope I can. Uh, and some stuff like that. But, uh, you know, the, the requirement I've placed on myself is... Uh, no more than three years between Stormlight books with a slightly larger break between five and six because the first five are an arc. Um, but I'm hoping no more than five years there, um, but we will we will see. Um, and got to just keep moving. Uh, keep going, keep, keep writing uh, so that my own mortality does not become a factor in the completion of the, uh, the Cosmere sequence. Um, I don't think I already asked this one, but mm -hmm. I may have been distracted when, mm -hmm. if I did. Anyway, uh, what do you think makes a great fantasy creature, and what is your process when you make one? Great question. Um, will you text Emily? It's uh, it's his bedtime, yep. um, and so she knows to, to come get him. You can see he's getting a little rambunctious. <gasps> yes, hello. Um, are you going to gonna talk for us? Jello bird. <laughs> hello, Jello bird. Yeah, he's... He only says Jello Bird. He never will be prompted to say it. He says it a lot, but he won't be prompted. Um, but he, he goes to bed around this time every day. And if he stays up past his bedtime, he starts to get a little wired like my children do. So uh, be expecting some extra uh, Magellan craziness. Jello Bird. Yeah, you're trying to work those wings. Work those wings so you can learn to fly. Um, all right, next question. Oh, did I answer that other question? I don't know if I did. Uh, fantasy creatures. Fantasy creatures. What I didn't makes them good and then uh, how you go about creating them as well. So, uh, fantasy creatures. I try to look, I try to build mine up from the ecology of the world I'm building. Um, I try to extrapolate from that. And this is just because I have this sort of one foot in fantasy, one foot in science approach to writing the Cosmere in particular. Um, and because of that, I want the, the flora and the fauna to feel integrated with the world that they're on and to be interesting in that aspect. Um, obviously, I have not done this on most, in most books to the extent that I did in Stormlight. Um, but it is one of the fun things for me to do <clears throat> is to ask, what have I changed about this world? What would that do to the ecology? Oh, man, you're getting good. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna be flying. You're, you'll learn to do it. Hello. Uh, I think he still has one feather on one of his wings that's clipped, and I don't know. Actually, he's got one on each, I can see, under there, so he hasn't gotten those yet. He still should be able to fly, but. Um, so yeah, what do I look for other than that? I want something that's visually interesting. Uh, I want something that'll draw well. Um, I want something that'll, 
that'll not just be what I've seen before, um, and that will be a nice take on what I've seen before. Uh, for. That's the thing. I, I mentioned it before. Human creativity is about recombining things in interesting ways. That's how we seem to work. Um, we, uh, we don't come up with something we've never seen before. We put a horn on something we've seen before and call it something new, which is cool. We're remixers is what we're really good at doing. And I ask myself, what can I remix that I haven't seen remixed before? Hey, Kara has shown up. The uh, master of the uh, of the the basement, I suppose. Do you, but do you have a title um, of other the than world. CFO and stuff? But like you know, a fantasy uh, title. I think Queen of oh, the yeah, Underworld yeah. is pretty good. Queen, Queen of the Underworld, the Underworld is is not bad. I you yeah, you're welcome. Mm. Mm. Kara is in charge of all of our shipping operations, though Mem really handles it now. But Kara is kind of uh, Mem's boss, and Kara handles all of our merchandising uh handles all of our con uh, appearances yeah, and booths and things and so yeah uh she's the person you have to convince if you have a really cool board game you want to make up based on my books uh hence go through my agent uh and also already have had some made some board games um but you know like uh kara was in charge of overseeing oh we should mention the cool thing right um the uh, did we t start taking uh, pre-orders on the um, Call to Adventure? Yeah, that's yes, we did. Wise, Brotherwise games. Yeah, I know they're already sold out of the deluxe one. Are they? Yeah, uh, they sold out really. It's a fun. Game. It is. It is. Awesome. I played this. It is so much fun. It's a storytelling game that also you can play competitively or you can play cooperatively, yeah, and it cool. works really well for kind of building your own thing. So. Well, um, and the art on the cards. The art of the cards it's is the great. Best. So yeah, go to my website for that. But they've sold out of the Lexington. But you can thank Kara. Um, obviously, you think Brotherwise first. They're the ones who made it. Yes. But Kara's the one who oversaw it on our side, Kara and Isaac. And uh, they uh, they do all the merchandising stuff so that I can just say, wow, that looks cool. Good job. <laughs> and um, then go back to writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emily may not have uh, have seen the text. Jello needs to go to bed. You, uh, you can send a minion or something, but if you can let her know, Jello needs to go to bed. Uh, and Emily is, uh, you know, I would send him with one of you, but he would probably gnaw on your fingers. Yeah, so he doesn't know us very well. Yep. Let's give him to Lex. Yeah, Lex loves. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, the next question is, uh, how do you go about working with villain motivation? What is your style on antagonist creation? Um, I... I've got thoughts. Like on everything, I've got thoughts. I like a variety of villains. Um, I like... Uh, I think it is okay to have the big faceless evil in a fantasy book. It's just another tool that you can use, right? You shouldn't feel that you can't have one of those. Um, but my favorite villains, and a lot of people's favorite villains, are the villains whose motivations make a twisted kind of sense. There's a reason why when people say, who's your favorite villain in all of fiction, I say Magneto. And I am not alone on that. I bet he would win a lot of polls of best villain of all time. Uh, because he reflects like uh, human evil has done him such harm that he has has a natural, sympathetic, and understandable motivation that he takes too far. Um, the human evil has turned him evil in ways that is very frightening, realistic, and uh, and frankly interesting. Um, that's my favorite kind of villain. Uh, the favorite, the, the villain that you read and you say there but. For the grace of God go I, right? Um, and um, that just really, really works for me. And so, um, but that is really hard to do. Oh, we're going to, oh, look, Emily's here. Yeah, come on down. Look, look. Here, I'll give you a scritch. Yeah, you want to go over to Emily because she sings. She, Emily sings to him. Yeah, you got to go to Emily. I know, you want to get on my shoulder. <laughs> You, you don't want to go home and go to bed, but bye bye Jello. Good night. Go to bed. Be a good bird. Um, so um, there is a there is a cost to a villain like this. Um, 
one of these costs is that you got to give them a lot of screen time to establish this. And not every book has the time to give this much screen time to a villain. In fact, if you're writing a strictly first person viewpoint book, it's going to be even harder because if you're only in one character's viewpoint, you're going to have to put that character with that villain uh, together in a situation. Um, and certainly there are lots of stories that do this, but there are a lot of stories. That this is just basically impossible. Um, and so in that sort of case, you use a different style of villain and you can give humanizing touches here and there. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no one catch all that makes a great villain work. Uh, in my class, I use uh, Tolkien as an example of this because I think he did a really great job by both having the faceless evil um, in Sauron, one, only one piece of the face, and I, um, and um, that was just unknowable and evil. And then showing various things along the spectrum from Gollum to Boromir to the Ringwraiths, um, uh, you know, to, to Saruman, this whole idea of this great evil can corrupt people toward it. And the scary thing, you know, the great evil existing in the world is scary, but the scarier thing is watching people be drawn toward it and being corrupted over time. Um, or in, in like the case of Gollum, um, this character who's struggling to come back from that and ultimately fails, spoilers for Lord of the Rings, but um, yeah, th that's just, it adds so much to that story. Um, and so I think there are lots of different ways you can do this. And I have read plenty of books where the villain is just a jerk, not a faceless evil and not someone who's really understandable, emot like, like Hans Gruber, right? Hans Gruber is just a jerk. He is not a faceless evil. His motivations are not really that sympathetic. He is a jerk. But man, is he the best jerk I've ever seen in film, right? Like there, Thank there, you, Alan there is not a, uh, like that is the quintessential archetype for the non-sympathetic, non-all-powerful, jerky villain who I just love. Um, and there's not a lot of depth to him. There's a little bit. There's the depth of, you know, he obviously is very, very prideful about how great a thief he is by that famous line in uh, in Die Hard. But man, so like anytime you see these rules about what a villain should be, remind yourself a villain is just another tool in telling a great story and different tools make different types of great stories. Um, the next question, uh, this person wants to know what makes Dark Souls one of your favorite games? Uh, oh, wow, great question. All right. So, couple things. Um, I play video games for a challenge. Uh, not everyone does, and that's okay. But without a challenge to a game, a game is usually missing something for me. Uh, this is why I can play and enjoy Animal Crossing, but Animal Crossing will never be my favorite game. Uh, the challenge just isn't there for me. Challenge isn't everything, right? Like there's a reason why uh, like bullet hell games are not my favorite, even though they can be generally considered Twitch wise, some of the most challenging games out there, right? The insane Mario levels, I don't play. Um, the ones that are fan created and stuff like that. So it's not just difficulty, um, but I do like a challenge. So thumbs up on Dark Souls, right? I like games that have elegant game design that I admire. Uh, one of the things I love about Dark Souls, if you haven't played it, the level designs are really elegantly and intricately created. Uh, you go, you see this you know, wall, later on you're gonna walk on that wall and you're gonna see this in the background, later you'll be there and this gate that you passed that you thought was just dressing, you'll eventually open that so it's a pathway to run to the next section if you die and, and things like this and um, it interlocks in such a beautiful way um, that uh, it's just majestic to me because of that. So there's that. I like games that teach me really well how to play the game, that I feel I'm leveling up as I play the game rather than the character just leveling up. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved RPGs because I could just level up my character and win. Now I like games that force me to level up my gameplay. Um, and a lot of roguelikes are really good at this. That's why you've heard me mention FTL and, um, and Slay the Spire, Spelunky, things like this. 
Um, these are games that you don't think you can possibly do it when you get to a new difficulty spike in the game, but then the game has trained you to the point that you're better at it than you think you are. Dark Souls is really good at this. Um, I love that the difficulty of Dark Souls rarely feels cheap. And this is what I'm, why I like it as opposed to, say, some really hard Mario level. A lot of these Mario levels um, get really hard that, that are fan-made by putting an invisible block that when you jump across this thing, you just run the block it, uh, into the, the block and die, right? There are very few things like that in Dark Souls. Uh, once in a while, you'll set off a trap, and you're like, oh, crap, i got to watch out for that. But from then on, you're watching for those traps, and you can spot them. You can't ever spot an invisible block, but you can spot the Dark Souls traps. You can look up and say, hey, wait, that thing's probably going to drop, drop on me, isn't it? Hey, there's a cord on the ground here. Um, and it rarely feels cheap. Uh, and when it does, you learn and you get over the cheapness and you learn to hit the chest with your sword before you, uh, before you uh, open the chest. And you get, feel very satisfied when that other chest is a mimic and you find it and it doesn't get you. Um, and so um, that's all on top of, I think, Dark Souls has really incredible uh, storytelling mixed with gameplay. A lot of people really like story-driven games like, say, uh, Mass Effect, and I do too. Uh, Mass Effect, great game. Um, and But these are kind of traditional, almost novels or, or movies in game form. I, what I love about Dark Souls is it uses its style of storytelling, which is all through ephemera. Almost all the storytelling you get from Dark Souls is through objects you pick up and read about or throwaway comics that characters make when you're interacting with them. Um, and it almost never stops the gameplay. You are in the world and you can piece together really cool lore. And why this works is Dark Souls is about this kind of fallen kingdom, right? Um, a fallen kingdom built on top of a fallen kingdom built on top of a fallen kingdom. And so picking up lore where you're like, you pick up an object and it has like this, this little mystery to it and it has a little bit of lore talking about it that stretches back thousands of years really enhances this idea that this is a fallen empire that you are part of, that its glory days are gone. And that style of storytelling enhances the gameplay that they're trying to make where you feel isolated and alone. Uh, the very early From Software games, which is the company that made Dark Souls, uh, were Kingsfield, and I loved those um, for the same reason. I felt isolated. I felt alone. I felt like this single person wandering through a destroyed kingdom full of these, these monsters and things, but even the monsters felt alone. And in Dark Souls, like all of them, they feel like they're all fighting alone. They're, it's, it's really solemn, somber, melancholy in a beautiful sort of way. So uh, those are some of the reasons I like the Dark Souls games. Uh, let's do another uh, fan mail. So, you told me one of these is really fun, so I'm hoping to get to that one uh, at some point tonight. Um, so this one... Um, comes from Down Under, I comes believe. Comes from Down Under, awesome. <laughs> ah, ah, so this is what you were refer referencing. Uh, so... From Jamie, your biggest Aussie fan. Hey, watch out for the drop bears. Uh, you did Tim Tam for me. This is Branderson, Master of the Cosmere. Uh, I am a comic book. I have never, I've been a comic strip before, but I've never been a comic book, Jamie. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, five cents, nice. Get, get them hooked early with the, with the, with the, with the cheap ones. Uh, can Branderson write an end to the true desolation? Read and find out. Tales of Roshar, number four. New issues monthly from 8th Octant. Ah, so this is in-world ephemera. Oh, yeah, that's not a cent sign. That is actually... Boxing. Uh, well, it's, no. uh, it's, um, it's, yeah. Issue 210. Nice. So, um, this is... Uh, you even put Cosmic Comics, which is the place where I bought books. Uh, this is the person who's been watching. The place where I bought The Wheel of Time when I was uh, 18 or... No, 15, whenever it came out. When I bought Eye of the World was Cosmic Comics, the bo uh, bookstore that's not there anymore. So, uh, you rock. This is one of the coolest things I've ever been given. Uh, this is definitely going to go in our uh, in our brag sh um, sheet. We have a big. We put all of this sort of stuff in a in a big uh, folder that then we put on the coffee table uh, for people who visit to look through and see, and that's going right in there. Uh, 
This is the one I assume you told me was really cool. Uh, Jamie, you're awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, if you guys want to send me something, Adam will give you the, the address of the P.O. box. Um, but, uh, and we usually send, send something back. I didn't, Kara comes up with it. Mem and Kara come up with it. Uh, we still do need to know who sent me the, the pen, right? Uh, the nice pen. If you sent me a, a really nice uh, wooden pen that you made yourself, we uh, lost the envelope. Don't know who did that, so drop us an email. So, uh, what time do we have, Adam? Uh, it's 7.30. 7.30, I great. think this is the final stack. Final stack? Yes. All right. Done with Way of Kings. But done with Way of Kings. Yes. Uh, unless, unless um, we sell so many copies <laughs> in the Kickstarter. Uh, hopefully you guys will buy so many copies and copies in the Kickstarter that I have to do this for the next uh, the next ten months as well. Uh, what are we doing next in two weeks? Um, Is that did we get I the stuff we, from we, tour? We got tour stuff? Tour. So I think we'll be doing tour stuff. Um, yeah. So we'll be signing stuff for tour. Uh, tour has some. Um, so rhythm war. Yeah. Someone in the chat, April mm -hmm. Halstead, said that. She was the one that sent the pen. She's going to email, so yeah. hopefully April, that's April, if I met true. you before, that name sounds familiar to me. Um, but, yeah, we have been. We want to send you uh, back a little, a little thing for sending that to us. So we appreciate that, April. It is a gorgeous pen. Uh, you may not have been here on the last one, where the one where we opened it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so drop us an email. Uh, thanks, April. Cool. Um, all right, so... Um, this next person wants uh, you to talk about flashbacks, mm. and their specific question is, how much do you have to show about the past of your characters? So how much do you have to show? Uh, you know what I'm going to say. There are no rules. Um, there is nothing you have to do. Flashbacks, though, they can be great. They can be a minefield. Uh, let me talk about some of the minefield aspects of a flashback. First is, you're going to have to decide how you're going to do your flashbacks, because there are a lot of different ways. Um, I do my flashbacks uh, in the Stormlight Archive as a separate narrative line, and basically we have uh, multiple timelines in the books where you're getting a character's timeline catching them up to the start of the Way of Kings. Uh, this works very well in an epic fantasy because I have lots of space and I can separate these chapters off that are flashback chapters completely on their own and they can be isolated. Um, a lot of more uh, more common, the type of flashbacks you see from a lot of people, is the stop and think about it flashback, and then cut to a new scene, and you are seeing actively what the character is remembering at that time. Uh, this is the Lost method, uh, the TV show Lost. Uh, a lot of uh, television shows and movies use this, and they, they actively show the character thinking about it. I rarely do this. Once in a while in the Stormlight Archive, you'll see a character start to tell a story about their past, and it'll, I'll make it align with the next flashback chapter that you're going to get. Um, but really what's happening is character is telling another person a really shortened version of events, because when you're getting the flashbacks, it's actually not a flashback. The character isn't thinking about it. That's a separate timeline. Um, another way to do it is the kind of in the middle of a chapter. You're not doing a scene break. You're just flashing back to what happened. Uh, and there it gets tricky with tense. Tense can be really a challenge in this. The, I had done this or, or whatnot, or if you're not going to use the tense, it can get really confusing. If you're not going to do a tense change, you're just going to put that in past tense too, both of which are viable. I've seen them done uh, very well. But those in-scene uh, flashbacks can get really telly and really hard for readers to track and kind of uninteresting for them to read. Uh, the danger with any flashback, but this is the one that has the, the most trouble, is that the, the reader will feel like the story is not progressing and instead they are wasting time doing something else and that they are not interested in attaching to this. Uh, and this is a, this is a, a challenge even with the, the Stormlight Archive ones, right? There are people who just do not attach to the flashback sequences because they are, by nature of their story, prequels. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a challenge of writing them. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, what do you gain? Why would you do this? Well, it's a really cool way to build motivation for your character, depth for your character, and to show a different place and time in your story so that you can show how much has changed. Uh, we talk about show versus tell, 
and you can use a flashback to show a, a character's changes quite dramatically uh, in this manner. You can also get information to the reader in ways that would have been really telly otherwise, right? Sometimes flashbacks read telly. And when I say telly, it's there. They're boring because they're info dumps uh, and they're just giving you a whole bunch of information. A lot of times, if you do a flashback right, it feels more active and more interesting way, a more active and interesting way to get the same information across to the reader rather than having the character sit and explain about their lives to people. You just get to experience and see it. Um, but that's just one tool, right? Um, and like them all, like all of them, gauge for your own story if this tool is going to enhance the story you're trying to tell or if it's uh, something that you should save for a different story. Uh, this next question is funny. Yep. Uh, it says, who bullies whom, Yasna or Catswain? <sighs> who bullies whom? Um, I would like to think that Yasna and Catswain would very quickly determine that they should have mutual respect for one another and keep to their own spheres. Um, they would meet, they would turn around, and they would walk the other way from each other um, and go on bullying other people. <laughs> this, uh, the second half of the question mm -hmm. is, uh, who would win, Dalinar with his shards or Zeth in Stormlight? Dalinar with his shards, a uh, young Dalinar with his yeah, shards. Maybe Prime. Yeah, yeah, Dalinar in his Prime versus Zeth. Um, I think long run Zeth wins. Um, the reason for this being, um, like, Stormlight is just an unfair advantage. You take away the Honor Blade from Zeth, and Dalinar does win. Uh, Zeth is good, but Zeth, uh, Zeth doesn't have experience with plate um, nearly as much. Uh, he has been trained almost exclusively on Honor Blades and Surges. His fighting styles are all built around them. Um, he is an expert at uh, using Surges, but if he doesn't have those, uh, he's got nothing. Dalinar, good at a lot of different fight fighting styles, has been in war a ton, uh, and um, even if he didn't have plate and you put the two of them without powers against each other, Dalinar is probably going to win. Cool. But uh, if, if Zeph has an honor blade, like, I mean, being able to heal and being able to fly, these are two almost insurmountable advantages in a one-on-one -on -one combat. Cool. Um, this next question says, which fantasy character, and they don't have to be from your books, mm -hmm. would you want to be a sidekick to? Hmm, fantasy character I want to be a sidekick to. Can I pick Gandalf? Yes. I'll be a sidekick to Gandalf. How much fun would that be? Right? Um, yeah. So what would you name your horse? His is Shadowfax. His is Shadowfax? Um, let's see. Um, well... Um, if I remember correctly, it's you know, um, probably something to do with a modem because you know faxes were big back then. But I grew up during the era of modems, so AOL Online would be the name yeah. of your horse. AOL Online, they s <laughs> AOL Online. I still, uh, you guys know this story, right? AOL almost cost me getting published. I don't know if you've told that. I one. think I've told this one, just in case I haven't. When you first got online back in the dark ages, right, in the late 90s, uh, a lot of times your, uh, your email was attached to your ISP. For instance, oh. getting your, um, when you got the internet, AOL gave you an, um, a, an email. That was your email. Um, and I had two emails. One was from my school, but I wasn't going to be able to access that when I graduated, so I had to use the AL one. This is so long ago. It's before Gmail. It's even before Hotmail. Yes. Uh, and you guys are like, what's Hotmail? Um, or at least if Hotmail existed, uh, newbies on the internet um, like me did not understand about it. And so um, this is one of the ways that ISPs kept a stranglehold over you. Uh, long after... Uh, getting your internet from AOL made any sense, I continued to do it because I would lose my email address if I uh, got rid of it. Eventually, I bit the bullet and changed to a more rational ISP, and I lost my email address. With no offer for forwarding that I could see, and no chance of any ever getting any of those emails. 
Um, now maybe this is my own stupidity not knowing how, maybe they did offer forwarding, but I believe that they did not. Um, and all of the, the books that I had sent out that I thought were still in consideration, I made sure to send and say, this is my new information. There was one book I had sent out, Elantris, that had been out for over a year and I'd had no communication from the editor that I just assumed because I had sent some things to tour before and they had vanished, had vanished. I'm like, well, I'll, uh, I'll give that one up for gone. Didn't think to send um, a forward of information. And then uh, um, Mosher finally read it 18 months after I sent it to him and wanted to buy it. But my email address didn't work. I had moved and my phone number was different. Um, and you know, I, maybe it's overly dramatic to call say AOL almost cost me this because I had also moved and um, also had gotten a cell phone during that time. Um, this was before most people had mobile phones. I got one at this point, but before that it was my landline. So if you move, you lose your address and your phone number. Um, and so he tried contacting me to buy Elantris and um, I didn't live, live at the same address and I didn't have the same phone number and my email bounced. And so uh, in one of the most kind acts um, in, in human history, Moshe uh, looked me up at BYU, found my uh, graduate student faculty page, got my new phone number from that and called me and offered to buy Elantris. So um, I suspect that Moshe is very happy he did that uh, since as a contractor with Tor, uh, he gets paid based on how well the books do, as I understand. I could be wrong on that. I don't see his contracts, but uh, I think he's been very pleased uh, that uh, that he picked me out of the pile. Um, but yeah, if uh, if he hadn't done that, who knows, right? Um, so there's an alternate timeline out there where um, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, that Moshe never calls me, and who knows what happens. Um, this next question... Um they're hoping you can talk about soft magic system. The specific yeah. question is, mm -hmm. do you look down on writers or stories with soft magic systems? And do you have a favorite soft magic system? What are the advantages yeah. of them? Absolutely not. Do not look down uh, on them. It is a style that I don't naturally write as much, but they can be great. Um, uh, some of the best sort of soft magic systems, they work so well in horror stories, right? Like um, a lot of the, a lot of the horror things you'll read, like they don't understand the magic, the magic is wrong, um, the characters try to apply it and it goes crazily wrong, it's just really bad. Um, but I, I think whatever the story, a soft magic system can be great. Um, I often reference, uh, I've referenced Gandalf a lot. Gandalf is a great soft magic system. Um, why is Gandalf so great? And I'm sorry to repeat myself from my class, uh, but I do think it is legitimately one of the best examples. Uh, Pat's, uh, Pat Rothfuss's uh, Name of the Wind also has a beautiful soft magic system that is perfect and does the same sort of thing. So what are these soft magic systems doing? Well, they are enhancing the sense of wonder in the story and they are making the main character feel a little smaller um, in a good way. Meaning they, there are things that you can't understand in this world there are things that maybe there are rules to them, but they're just not rules that are meant for mortals or that we quite comprehend yet. And this adds this sense of wonder, mystery, terror, um, and fright to a story that a hard magic system works against. Uh, what a hard magic system is going to work toward is a sense of, um, of a character having control over their destiny, um, of a world being understandable, um, it's going to, in some ways, make the world smaller rather than larger um, because the character can master their destiny and can change parts of it. And the more soft your magic system is, the more of a large and mysterious world you get, and the more hard your magic system is, the more kind of a small and controllable world. Now, hard magic systems can be great because you usually want your characters to have a sense of proactivity. They want, you want them to be able to control, be controlling their destiny. These are things that make for good storytelling. But mystery, wonder, and, um, and a sense that the, the world is a greater world than your character are also great things for stories. Um, and 
That's why I often bring up Tolkien or Pat, uh, because Pat's soft magic system um, works really well in this in this way of contrasting his hard magic system that the character can learn and figure out this magic, but he really wants to learn this other magic. Except the other magic, there aren't rules that you can really learn. Uh, not in the same way. Um, another kind of good look at this, if you guys... Uh, um, so Nora, uh, N.K. Jemisin's um, 100,000 Kingdoms, basically has a soft magic system locked behind a hard magic system. There are these mystical beings, godlike deities, that we can't understand, but we have figured out how to harness, control, and, uh, and enslave them, basically. But there's this sense that we don't quite understand all the things we think we do, and they might be playing us all along. Um, and so it's one of these ones that walks the line, right? It's like, we think this is a hard magic system, but it's powered by a really terrifying soft magic um, that gives a sense of horror to everything that happens. Uh, really a masterful use of hard and soft magic in... Um, in, in that book, in that series. Um, so you should never feel like, because Brandon does something, I, you know, I should do it that way. I do something because number one, I really like it, right? Like I like making it. It's really interesting and exciting and fun for me to make these things. It's how my brain works. Um, and beyond that, turns out I'm good at it. Um, and so because I'm good at it, uh, because I seem to understand it really well, um, and things like that, I do it, I hope, um, you know, I try to get better at it and things like that. That's the, that one's upside down. Um, but, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to do it my way, um, at all. You said a misprint or... Oh. No, they're just, uh, there's, there's some that just are, um, just kind of need to be moved around. So, yeah, uh, so soft magic systems can do all kinds of things. Um, they can, yeah, they, and I haven't even touched on all the things that soft magic systems can do, so. Uh, probably the final question, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, what were your early inspirations for the Cosmere, and how did your original ideas change over time? Great question. Uh, so, I have to kind of retro, look at this in retrospect, right, and say, what were my, uh, inspirations? Because while they were happening to me, I didn't like look at them and say, that's an inspiration, right? Um, it was just happening and going on in my head. And usually I can trace it back to a couple of events. Um, the one that's kind of internal to me is, I got into fantasy novels, as I've said many times when I was 14, uh, with Melanie Ron and Anne McCaffrey's books. Um, and um, I started reading these books and one thing that I just kind of naturally wanted to do was to start add my, adding my own characters into them. Um, this happened particularly when I would reread a series and I knew it was going to happen. I would imagine a connection between uh, the worlds of Anne McCaffrey and David Eddings and uh, Tad Williams um, and eventually Robert Jordan after his books uh, came out where I'm like, this character is, is actually this other character from this book, and they, they got to this world like this. And I was kind of doing this whole like hidden um, mystery universe thing in the books I was reading. Um, and that is what gave birth to Hoyd, uh, originally named Topaz, uh, sometimes called Wit, um, who is the character who travels between the different books and worlds. Um, also, during this time, um, I read Foundation by Isaac Asimov, and saw how he combined Foundation and the Robot series later in the, uh, the Foundation series in a way I thought was really quite brilliant. Um, and I thought, I love how different series can, can seem like they were separate, but then came together um, at once. I had read some Stephen King at this point, and I had read some, um, some Michael Moorcock, um, I was not aware of their continuities when I was reading them. Um, so I can't really point at either of them um, as inspirations here, though I did uh, really enjoy the books I read. I really have to look at Asimov and the, the weaving together of those two book series. That's the first time I consciously saw it being done uh, and marveled that it was possible. Um, and I think these are the, the strongest two influences that gave birth to the Cosmere. 
um, the idea of an interconnected uh, fantasy universe uh, with characters uh, sneakily moving between uh, between series. And I had to be very quiet about it because um, this was not the sort of thing that anyone had really done on the scale I wanted to do it. And um, I was understanding at the time that uh, editors were very, very daunted by the idea of large series. Everyone was, so when I was trying to sell, this is gonna be another story, we might go a little over. Um, when I was trying to sell, something had happened in epic fantasy. Um, what had happened is uh, the 90s had propelled epic fantasy to being a headliner, mainstream, hardback, luxury book uh, thing. Like they were hitting bestseller lists, um, right and left. Uh, nerd culture was becoming just culture at that point. And uh, what had happened is Wheel of Time had gotten huge and Game of Thrones had not quite gotten there yet, but it was starting. And uh, Terry Goodkind, they had, um, by the stories I've heard, they bought for a large sum and then slotted it in in a just the right slot and put a huge marketing budget behind it and turned it into a big best-selling series. And uh, that first sort of truth uh, book is, is quite good. Um, I haven't read it in many years, but I really remember liking it. Um, and so there was this sense that the... Um, the publisher could manufacture uh, bestsellers. All of a sudden, fantasy is this new hot thing. Everybody wants epic fantasy. And if we put enough marketing budget behind it and put a cover on it that looks like Daryl Sweet did it, um, like the Wheel of Time covers, we can make a big bestseller. And they all went up and bought a whole bunch of epic fantasies and tried to do this, and the next group of them just flopped hardcore. Uh, the fifth sorceress is the one I usually point to as the example uh, of this. Um, you guys can research on that one. Um, but uh, just a big high profile set of flops. Uh, meanwhile, we had the YA revolution in fantasy, uh, led of course by Harry Potter, followed by Twilight, um, in which suddenly the new hotness was YA. So I'm trying to publish during this time epic fantasy when all the publishers have scaled way back in buying the, their epic fantasy. Um, and because of this, they were not looking for big series. They've been burned too much. And they were, the, what I was hearing from the editors was don't write that it's the first book in a series. If you wanna write, it's a standalone novel with sequel potential, great. But don't go, this is the first of 10. That's just, we've been burned too many times on that. Uh, and there's some wisdom to what they were saying, right? If you can't write a really great first book, then how are you going to convince the readers that you can write a great ending to the series? Um, but this meant that they did not want to hear that I had a 36 book series of interconnected worlds that I was wanting to do, um, that was growing as my plan more and more. Uh, I didn't have it in mind when I started Elantris, but by the time I was writing Mistborn and Stormlight, I did. So somewhere in those two, three years, um, Elantris was like 98 and um, Stormlight was 2002. So in those four years is really where it kind of came uh, to be. And I started sending these things out and I did not tell anybody. Uh, I hid Hoyd pretty well. I'm like, I can't do this because they're just going to reject these. Um, and then something else was happening right around these times that I was starting to publish these. And this was the little thing we call the MCU, um, which uh, came along and um, changed the way people look at serialized storytelling, let's just say. Um, and be, it started before that. Uh, 24, the television show is often pointed at. Um, I was loving Deep Space Nine during its series, but this is before that where they were trying to do a continuity. Uh, a lot of thing people say what's happened is the internet changed the way we uh, consume media in more ways than one. And one way that people don't focus on is this idea that you can <coughs> easily look up summaries for the things you've forgotten. Those of you who are younger and don't know the days of picking up a Wheel of Time book uh, two years after you'd read the last one and a new one is out and having no idea who any of these side characters were and not having any resource to find out who they are except the glossary in the back. Uh, those were, you know, you can understand maybe why the studio execs were like, don't make it serialized. Don't make people think they have to have read 
or seen all of this. Try to keep away from doing these long interconnected arcs uh, in television. You can watch the DVDs on, um, on uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, which is my favorite um, of the Star Trek series, though Next Generation, of course, is awesome. Um, and they talk about how they would have to hide from the execs that they were doing this, this con interconnected uh, storyline, and they would show them the Ferengi episodes so they'd laugh and be like, all right, the season looks good. And then they would do this like big arc. They had to do it on, uh, on the sly. Um, and the internet changed all that. Suddenly people could look up summaries. Suddenly fan sites could be really easily accessible. Uh, and suddenly that depth that before had been too daunting to try to keep track of became a huge selling point for a lot of different series and things like that. And I was just lucky enough to be on the forefront of doing this um, because I had been doing it for years before and been had, had to hide it. And then right about when all of this was changing in television and movies, I happened to have a book series that already had multiple uh, um, volumes out that was already doing this. Um, and I do think that that was a really lucky right place at right time. Um, I think that there's a possibility that if I had been publishing in the 80s, I would have crashed and burned um, because, you know, this whole continuity thing would have just, you know, terrified people. Um, and the people who went before me, like, uh, like Stephen King, um, he had to keep it really kind of slight, except in the Dark Tower, that these things were connected because of this, this same problem, right? Uh, nobody could really get away with it on the, the level that we're driving toward in the Cosmere um, during those eras. So uh, it's really exciting. It's fun to be able to do something that's kind of new, uh, kind of old, but kind of new at the same time. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, I think we're going we're gonna to call it there. Thank you guys so much. I do have a little fan mail here that we didn't get to, so we'll get to that uh, in future, uh, future things. We do these every two weeks or so. So uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Take care.